come together and unify. All right. Thank you all for joining us today. Today is February the 6th at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, you're with the International Association of Woodcarvers, where carvers are helping carvers during the pandemic. Um, before we get started today, I wanted to tell you some things that are coming up with our group. Uh, we've got quite the lineup that's uh, scheduled through April so far. Um, today we have on uh, Claus Creation, uh, Claus Larson. He's coming to us from Sweden. Uh, he's going to talk to us about bowls, spoons, and knives. Uh, some of the other people, and I'm just going to read the list off real quick, the other people that we have lined up. We got Brian Melton uh, that's going to be talking about life-size carvings. Lucas Koss that's going to be talking about cottonwood bark. Uh, Dwayne Gosnell is going to come on and do a demonstration on study sticks. Uh, Rich Embling's coming back to talk about marionettes. Uh, Mary May, that's got a traditional school of wood carving, is going to be coming on and doing a demonstration. Uh, she's with uh, MaryMayCarving.com. Uh, Janet Cordell's coming up in March. She's going to be doing a demonstration. Uh, James Ray Miller's coming back to do a demonstration. Tim uh, Crawford from Chip Chats and the National Woodcarvers Association is going to be coming on in April. Alec Lacoste is actually coming back to do uh, our one-year anniversary meeting. That'll be around uh, the middle of April. And then uh, Bruce and Kenny is going to be coming on in April also to do a demonstration. So we have quite the lineup that's ahead of us. Uh, I want to remind everybody about some classes that are going on or coming up. Uh, Dave Stetson started a class today on a dancing fiddler. Uh, he's going to have some other classes that will be coming up in the near future, so keep an eye out on Facebook and the announcements on Woodcarving Academy uh, to see what uh, classes he's having. Kevin Applegate's going to be starting another class on a Viking. Uh, Janet Cordell's doing a class on a grizzly bear. Uh, Ryan Olson's doing a class on, uh, he's going to finish up his hot tub creation. Uh, Dwayne Gosnell's going to be doing a class on pirates. Uh, Del Green's going to be doing a class on Boomer, which is a guy sitting on a gas tank. And then Bob Hershey just signed up to do a class on a surfing frog. So uh, you can all tell that there's quite a few things that's coming up. If you want to get involved in wood carving, you want to take some classes, take advantage of these opportunities. Uh, it's a good opportunity to sit with some of the best carvers out there and get some, uh, some great detailed instruction that you probably wouldn't even get in a class so, or a live class. So make sure that you take advantage of those. Um, a lot of these things are sponsored by Wood Carving Academy. You can go out and get the information from woodcar woodcarvingacademy.com. Um, make sure that uh, you check out uh, not only the classes that are being offered that's coming up, but also stuff that they've had um, provided from other carvers as far as classes, and you can go out and do a subscription with them. So make sure you take advantage of that. Um, I also wanted to tell you that Alec Lacoste is doing ongoing classes in Cottonwood Bark. And Chris Hammock's also doing classes on design and caricature. Uh, you can reach out to those guys at any time and uh, they'll be happy to set up some classes with you. Uh, so make sure you take advantage of that. Uh, today we've got um, Claus Larson that's coming to us from Sweden. Uh, he's going to be doing a little bit of a demonstration and talk a little bit about uh, his carving bowls. I want to tell you a little bit about him. He lives in a uh, rural area about two hours north of Stockholm, Sweden. Uh, he studied a total of five years, three years in industrial design focused on wood technology and uh, two years in traditional woodcrafts where he ended up doing a traditional journeyman's test. And he became the second person in Swedish history with a degree in that. Um, so he's going to be talking to us a little bit about his uh, creations, his bowls, uh, spoons, and um, some of the other things that he makes. And he'll, like I said, he'll be doing a demonstration. Uh, so I I'm going to go ahead and go, turn it over to Claus. Claus, thank you for joining us from Sweden, and we look forward to hearing what you have to share with us. Oh, yeah. Can you hear me now? Yep, you're good. Thank you. Yeah, cool. It's very nice to be here, and I'm quite nervous. <laughs> it's been a long time I'm, since I've spoken to more than my family. Uh, and I don't know if I ever have spoken for an, a full hour in English, so it's kind of a weird experience. But I'll do my best, and if you don't understand, then just tell me, and I'll try to <laughs> explain it. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to share my screen. Um, So 
this. This is where I live. And this photo photo is from a couple of days ago. Uh, so this is taken from outside my shop. Um, yeah, and I'm 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 born and raised with with art and music and stuff like that around me in many ways. Um, and punk rock and revolution was always close to my heart. Um, then I grew up and I started to do all this, all this woodworking things. Um, and when I felt comfortable enough with it, I'm starting to mix those two things. Um, and that's why the title on this, uh, this thing. Um, yeah, so this is some stuff I'm gonna talk about but we will skip that. Yeah, and as mentioned, uh, I got my journeyman's letter uh, and this is from, and this photo is from when I got it uh, at the city hall in Stockholm in the same room as where they give out the Nobel prizes. Uh, so that was probably one of my proudest moments. Um, and the other picture is partly describing that I've been a graphic designer and illustrator before I went for woodworking. Um, yeah, and it, it, it's Class Creations. That's my company name that comes from a Australian dude who I told him my name was Klaus. Um, and he thought it was some kind of artist name and thought it was Klaus like that. Uh, so it stuck with me and yeah, now it's the name of my company. Um, so I'm, I trained for a few years in traditional Swedish woodcrafts. Um, and I, I have a great love for it, even though I don't, make stuff that looks like the traditional stuff. Uh, I use many of the same techniques and the knowledge that has been passed on. Um, so it's a mix of historical making and my own take on it. Uh, so I like these baskets and kuksas and things are like, I'm really small now, but this is like the same basket. Uh, so I, I'm trying to do, do it with my own touch, so to say. Am I like this small up in the corner? <laughs> yeah, we can see your screen better than we can see you, but we can still see you there on the side. Yeah, yeah. Then I'll show some stuff after I think, yeah. Uh, so spoons and all that stuff was part of my my school. Um, and shrink pots that I love, love to make. It's probably my third favorite thing to make. And bowls are probably up there as well. Um, but this is more of, of the stuff I was trained in, in industrial design school. I, I made this table this summer, I think. Um, so I do all sorts of woodworking uh, where carving is probably what I love most. Um, but I do furniture and everything in, in woodworking, so to say. Uh, here's some uh, I like to make these birds, uh, like li little, or this is maybe two feet wide or something like that. Uh, and some tables from solid pieces. Uh, so these are chainsaw carved and with angle grinders and stuff like that. Some more power carving. And I do some figures, a lot of birds, and 
a lot of like mixing techniques of traditional carving, but they are painted with uh, like graffiti artist spray paints and and uh, markers and stuff instead of linseed oil paints or whatever. And so that's like what I love the most. Here's a, a few things, more uh, wall art pieces like that. And the bowls uh, are a really big part and what I'm gonna show today. Um, here's some of my latest bowls. Unfortunately, I can't show them on video because they are a way to get photographed for a magazine, which I'm really excited about and, and so on. Um, but I wish I could show them on the video as well. As well. Uh, yeah, so that's about what I had. I'm gonna stop my screen sharing. Uh, let's see. So now I'm full frame, I'm guessing. So, shrink pots in all different. Here's one with a sliding dovetail lid. Uh, and here's more colorful stuff like this. And I love the, I love the finishing and painting my objects, and I I love trying out new techniques and different types of paints and so on. Like this shrink pot, that is like this is birch and. Um, but when it was green, I dipped it in black stain up to here. And while the wood would dry, um, the, the stain went through the grain of the wood and it became this like zebra weird stuff that I, that I love. Um, so I do a lot of that stuff. Like uh, sweeped boxes. Oh, now something weird is happening. <laughs> Am what? I back? <laughs> yeah. What makes, uh, what makes it a shrink pot? One more time. What makes it a shrink pot? What makes it a shrink pot? Yes. So, all the sides of this is from a solid piece. Okay. And it's carved out while it's green. And then you, in the bottom, you take a dry piece of wood, you carve out a small slit on the inside, you put it in. And while the wood dries, it shrinks to hold the bottom in place. Thank so you. That, that's the main idea of a shrink pot. That's, I think, yeah, here I did an experiment. This is a brass piece instead of a wooden piece in the bottom. So I'm trying different things with that as well. It's a, it's, very easy for them to, to crack. Um, yeah, sure. Uh, you, you need to be, you need to know the species, how much it shrinks and all that. Um, but it's really nice when you get a feeling for it and you can, you can get a really interesting stuff out of it. Some people make them with the bark left and it's just like having a log on the on the bench or, or whatever. Um, so it's a really interesting technique. Is, and that strict, is that strictly Swedish or 
I know Scandinavian, I would say, but I, I wouldn't say for sure. Um, My father was born in Lisa. They, they have made it in Sweden for hundreds of years. Um, like all the different, like the Kuksas and the, I don't know, like this basket, it's, all of them are techniques that are hundreds of years. My father was born in Sweden. I'd never heard of it, so I was curious. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's a, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's for me in the in the Swedish slöjd scene. Uh, it's something a lot of people do. Uh, a lot of people really love making shrink pots. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Yep, yeah, sure. Uh, if you have more questions, feel free to jump in. I'm happy to try to answer it. Um, but I'm gonna talk a little bit about the tools I'm gonna use, um, the traditional tools. I. And I, this is not traditional, but I use this as well when I'm when I'm feeling like it. Splitting knife. That's where it starts. Splitting the log. And I just use a. Uh, big old sh chunky elm mallet for this. I kind of love making bowls because it's it's not just the small movements, it's those too, but it's also like big hammer on stuff and get out a lot of energy. And uh, so it's awesome like that. Uh, I got to show you this. This is a an ads that a friend of mine uh, forged. And I'm, I'm gonna use it today. I have used it for like three minutes, uh, but it's beautiful and really well made. So if you're looking for an ads, um, check out 40 axis on Instagram. Uh, he makes some awesome stuff. And yeah, so I, I start rough carving with X adds, yeah, and I, I usually band saw out uh, the most basic shape, uh, but you can do that with an X as well. Um, and then I do f the finer stuff with uh, gouges and that's about it. It's a really intuitive, I would say, process of making bowls. Uh, and they can be made in so many different ways. They can be very strict and they can be like... Two very different like carved textures and super smooth. So there's so much variation in it. also happens that I do like more shallow stuff like this. And I'm a sucker for texture. So I always leave gouge marks in everything. I just love it. So I don't know if it shows up. This sh uh, uh, almost. <laughs> no. Yeah, I just love the gouge marks. So I usually, I start with making stuff fairly smooth and then I roughen them up. Uh, that's how I prefer to do it. Um, yeah, I'm, I think I'm gonna do some carving. Do, is all your work greenwood based? No, no. Um, I usually use whatever I have in hand. Um, 
my in-laws have some woods so when they they have some storm fallen trees or they need to take something down i usually get my hands on some stuff and then i do green wood stuff um today i'm gonna do it with dry wood because that's what i had but the process is more more or less the same it's just a drying thing that changes um yeah, but the carving process is the same, only it's harder in the in the dry wood. And but like, yeah, like this this basket as well. You do that with both green wood and and dry wood in the process because it's certain things are better for some things and so on. And let's see, yeah. I start with something like this, just a simple piece of birch. I, my carving stuff is mostly in birch. Uh, it's the most accessible species around here, except pine. Um, and it's good to work with. It's, yeah, it's good to work with. It's, it can be quite hard, um, but it's, mostly forgiving and uh, the tools stay sharp in it and yeah yeah so i'm going to actually i'm gonna spin the computer around and we can get a little bit better view See if it shows up. Yeah, I just have a small little thing to work with here. So what I'll do is I, I just start with a rough circle. Just to have something to reference of it. This is a weird custom thing I made uh, or modified, but any carving axe will do. I'm just gonna start with flattening the underside. Get it to stand. my computer gets full of chips yeah that's close enough and now i'm gonna do the the uh, what, what do you call it food food show thing and now i have band sawed this <laughs> I have the next piece. And here I did some trying with the new ads. And the principle is really start in the middle, do a little, flip it over. And you want to go cross grain. So you cut the, the grains off. And you go wider and wider. And then you start to go a little bit to the sides to to get the whole width of it. I'm gonna move you over. Let's see if I can get this to 
You see this? Yeah, kind of. Yeah, so I just go over it. And there is special benches and things you can make to hold the pieces better but I don't have them. I just use my tail bias on the, on my workbench. I flip it over. And I go on like that for a while when the when I've gone far enough that I'm not comfortable with the abs anymore I go over to a big gouge so this is a, a big yes two inch gouge and I use that and a mallet uh, let's see I'm gonna have the more with a little bit more curve and it's the same principle but I can be a lot more exact yes with the grain as much as possible I just shop away. There's nothing fancy to it, it's just violence. <laughs> and if this was if this was green wood, I would probably not need the mallet. I would probably just carve it by hand. Actually, maybe I can do it now. Let's see. Right about now, I usually get bored with it and I take my angle grinder and just do it faster. And that's about it. I do that until I have a rough shape like this, but I'll show you some of the outside carving. Is the, I use a hole fast, usually. Maybe the sound is getting crazy from the high volume. I don't know. It actually mutes it out um, yeah. while it's a little bit.
Klaus, instead of um, instead of cutting it in a full circle, you seem to cut it in an octagon. Is that to make it easier for your leg vi uh, your vice to hold it? Yes. So when I when I cut it with the the bandsaw, I I usually leave it. Uh, uh, at least faceted, I just rough saw it. Um, that way it's much easier to, to hold. And then when I've carved everything down, it's just the facets get smaller and smaller. And if I want to, I can just go over it with a, with a knife in the end if I really want it round. So that's- yeah. You Have you ever tried that? using 50% alcohol and water and spraying it down? No, I have not. Try that sometime. It makes it like yeah. butter. Cool. Uh, yeah, I'm going to try that out. That sounds like an awesome thing. Yeah. But I, I'm, my bowls, I usually rough card them green as often as I can. Uh, and then this process is three times as fast. Right, but it gives you a, a little smoother finish that way too. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But I'm also kind of like talking about finish, uh, like the smoothness of a cut. I'm in the, in the Swedish carving scene, it's like, everyone is like really, really hunting for that perfect cut and that perfect edged like thing. And I'm not, I'm, I enjoy a sharp tool and I enjoy a sharp, a smooth surface, but most of it disappears in the, in the greater like, here's a bowl sort of thing. Uh, and that's something I really appreciate because that makes it more like you can be a new carver and you can look at something that someone has done that has carved for many, many years and, and they can see the small defects of it. If we look at old Swedish stuff, uh, there's always those defects of an unsharp tool or whatever. And I think it gives it character in some way. But the alcohol thing for a work, like making the work easier, that sounds awesome. <laughs> yeah. But I'll, this is the whole thing. I'll do this until I get this. I'll go over to smaller, like. Smaller gouges like this after a while. This is our. Just a small piece of wood. When I carve now, if I slip, I don't hit the, the steel of this. And when it's this small, it's quite easy to just cut with your, without the mallet. What I'll do, if you see, I get this. I have this beautiful little tool that is probably my favorite tool. Just a 
it's gone. So this, if you can get your hands on this from Hans Carlson, uh, it's a wonderful tool. But that's more or less the the process. Um, before I go to any like making the the textures or the patterns or like there is some kind of pattern. A random like gouged pattern or the longer ones like that. Boss, can you talk a little bit about how you're uh, how you sharpen your tools and how often you do it with the green wood working? Yeah, I when I work in birch or for all woodworking, I use a Tormek system. Um, I have a Tormek T8. I use that for all all the tools, um, and I do some on Japanese water stones. Uh, so I'm touching up and then I just have a a piece of hardwood with um, some what is it called compound polishing compound yeah I, I use this all the time especially for my knives just a couple of times um, and that helps a lot and that's the whole whole thing that's all I do. Um, I try to strop it at, as much as possible so I don't have to sharpen it as much. Um, Are most of your tools Swedish made? Um, I have a lot of file tools and they are Swiss. Um, yeah, but I, I try to as much as possible buy Swedish tools um, to support Swedish companies. And we are good at steel cutting tools. Uh, but uh, I also like, I have a bunch of like Stanley and Veritas planes and uh, tools from all over. I have some, there's an old Japanese gouge. I, I, I buy a lot of old tools and restore them as well. Um, and I, I have some basic knowledge in, in blacksmithing. So I, I make a lot of my own carving knives. Um, so I just like this or this or yeah, this little one or yeah. Or maybe like I had like a five minute uh, thing wh where I thought I was going to be a, a bushcraft nerd. Uh, it, it helped, yeah, I, I lost that <laughs> quite fast. Then I made a knife like that. Um, I, I enjoy Swedish tools. I enjoy Swedish axes, especially. I used to work at one of the big Swedish axe manufacturers, putting handles on axes. Have you done any work on a lathe? Yes. I I have some basic knowledge. Uh, I do. Yeah, this one is from a lathe, and this is cut. Um, green as well a rough carb uh, in oak and i yeah i do i do work with most woodworking tools most both electrical and hand tools uh, depending on the job since i make all, everything from furniture to to wall art to to little figures yeah uh, yeah, and my the texturing thing is the is the same thing. See if I can do it. Yeah, 
I just do that. Oh, it's too light. Do that stuff. Can I? <laughs> it's hard. Yeah. Just do textures like that for, I don't know. I make a bowl like this in two hours, maybe. Uh, and if it's green wood, it's the whole drying process in between. Uh, but that's the basics of it. And then I spend maybe another hour or so with the painting and making it crazy. Um, which hey, Klaus, I we, have, we have a question in the chat. Somebody's wanting to know what your process is to dry the green wood so that yeah. it doesn't split after it's carved. Yeah. So usually this is about as far as I would go in the green wood. So I, I would save the, the finishing cuts and the, the texturing and the, maybe a little bit of like thinning out. Uh, I will use a paper bag. There's like different schools and different thoughts on this, of course, but I use a paper bag. I fill it with the, the, the shavings or the, what is it called? The, this stuff uh, from the bowl I just carved uh, and I put the bowl in there. Before I do that, I paint on um, glue on the end grain. So I usually mix just regular wood glue with a little bit of water uh, and I paint that on, on the end grain. Put it in the paper bag with the shavings uh, and I leave it like that in a, like this workshop would work quite well because it's uh, more moist than a regular house, uh, but it's not, it's not outdoors as well. Um, I, I would leave it like that. Nowadays I have a moisture meter so I can check it, but otherwise I would measure it with, uh, uh, with weight. So if you take a curve on the weight, it's gonna lose its weight slowly and then it's gonna flatten out in the, in the curb. Um, and when it's done that, it's getting close to the same moisture as, uh, as the room you're in. If that is a moist room, then you can move it over to a dry room after that. Uh, so I can take it in, just put it under my bed or whatever uh and leave it there for a while more and then it's dry so that's how, how i do it yeah uh class when you do yeah. the hand curve bowls is or do you only use birch or are there other wood that you use other than birch it happens that i use other species but birch is what i get my hands on easily uh, so mostly because of that and also because it's a fairly good wood to, to use. Uh, it's not too problematic with the grain structure and the hardness and so on. Um, so it's mostly that. I also use some Aspen if I wanna like traditional, um, what is it called? The oblong bowls, uh, Scandinavian bowls are often made uh, out of aspen that is good and soft uh, but it's it's more taxing on the the tools so they get they need more sharpening so i would prefer birch over aspen um, but i do like yeah i made bowls out of oak and elm and all sorts sorts of species like that yeah Hmm. And should I like, I can show some kind of more process, <laughs> uh, but that's more like, that's, I can show some more carving if you want to. Uh, Could you show us some uh, of your spoons? Yes, I only have one spoon here, I think. 
This is the first eating spoon I ever made. I, I gave it to my wife. There's a Swedish uh, uh, tradition that uh, if you have a, a spoon in your uh, chest pocket like this, it means you're single. And you, if you take it out and give it to someone, it means you have an interest in that person. So I gave this to her uh, four years ago or so. That that's like it's yeah just a just a spoon. Uh, here's a rosewood butter knife I made. Uh, it's hard to see all the faceting. Yeah, that's some of this stuff. Klaus, somebody's wanting to uh, know about your finishing process and painting yes. and how you make the bowls food grade so that people can use them for food. Yes. Uh, I have, with these latest bowls, the really colorful ones, I have disregarded the food grade thing entirely. I have let myself be the, the punk. I I am. Um, so that's made with spray paints and probably not very healthy to use for your for your food. Um, they are made more like art pieces. Uh, but otherwise I would use uh, regular uh, raw linseed oil uh, and that's it. Sometimes I would paint it with a there's some of the traditional pigments are food safe. So I would maybe paint the outside and with a mix of pigments and, and linseed oil, and then just oil the inside. Uh, yeah, yeah. Klaus, I'm wondering if you could, uh, being a true Swede, yeah. what's your definition of the term sloid. Yes. And uh, like we over here, we would think like uh, it's only cookses and spoons, but I believe it's a, it's a larger uh, handcraft uh, yes. definition or? Yes, it is. Um, sloid is, well, the word in itself comes from being sly or being, uh, like clever. So it was the, uh, the farmers and the working class and the, uh, the people that didn't have a lot of money. Uh, they needed to find solutions that rich people could buy their way out of. They could buy the tools, they could whatever, buy the bowls or whatever it is. Um, so they needed to figure out clever ways to, to, to get those things. Um, so that's what the word comes from. And it would, in Sweden, it would be everything from carving figures to making baskets to shrink pots and bowls and spoons and everything like that was, um, it's also, Sloyd is also uh, even wider than that because it's also with uh, textile work and with uh, all kinds of different materials. Uh, so you have wood Sloyd and you have textile Sloyd and so on. Um, so it's a really wide uh, term here. Um, then you, it's all, all connected, I think, to Almuge, which is um, the same people, the poor people of earlier times, um, also ma made furniture and stuff in a style that would look like the more expensive uh, furniture 
or so, but they did it in sheet materials and they did it in a, with cheaper options. Um, and that created something that is called Almuya, which is a like traditional style. Uh, and many people collect Almuge furniture and so on in Sweden uh, today. And they, they Slöjd and Almoge is very intertwined, so to say. Yeah. That's I have a question too. Go ahead. Uh, hi, Klaus. Hi, hey. everyone. Uh, do you have any projects upcoming now that you are excited about that you're looking forward to? Uh, yes. I, I'm going to make some kind of octopus carving for an author that's going to make a book about Swedish squids and octopuses. Uh, and it's going to be a gift for him uh, and that I'm really excited about. Um, it's going to be a quite big project. Um, yeah, and then I'm working with all the non-food grade bowls and uh, like uh, like this big thing I just made. Uh, I'm trying to. I'm oh I have this long-term goal of Sloyd being part of the fine arts community. Uh, that is my life goal, uh, so to say. Uh, so I'm trying to make stuff now that has more of a an idea behind why I make it than just to make it. Um, and I hope I'm hoping to get an art show at a gallery uh, when the COVID thing is better. Yeah. So that's my two big, like, things I look forward to, yeah. Have you worked with, uh, when Willie was alive, Willie Sunkist or his yeah. son? Yeah. So the, the school I went to, like, Ville was, he started this, Many of you probably know him, some may maybe won't, but he was really a big part of starting up this, this new wave of this interest. And uh, we have a lot to thank him for. Um, my school wouldn't have existed, I think, uh, if it wasn't for him. Um, yeah, yeah. I haven't met Jogge, uh, but he, he's around. Uh, yeah. 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 I took a class from his son about five years ago in uh, Indiana. He's yeah. a wonderful person. Yeah, he's super energetic. Yes. Yeah. He mm -hmm. took us out to the, the forest. And we cut down branches and we did everything from scratch all the way to the final product. Yeah. That's how it should be made. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. And I, I hope there will be more voices like his uh, in, in the Swedish Slide community, more people with more, with different views or with different techniques or like, the, so we can really He's doing an awesome job, but we need even more people to do the job that he does for, for Slade. Are you familiar yeah. with Harley Rothsall here in the U.S.? No. He does flat plane carving, and he comes to your country every year to give classes. Yeah. And uh, he, he was uh, trained under uh, Billy, and uh, um, he's uh, really, he, he does all small caricatures, flat planing, but he yeah. is remarkable. Uh, yeah. he, he follows the, the tradition very well. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. Yeah, he was knighted by your king. What? <laughs> what? <laughs> yes, he is so, 
he was so rec respected a number of years ago that your yeah. king knighted him. Oh, I thought they didn't knight anyone anymore. But oh, that's this cool. was a number of years ago. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Cool. Yeah, and it was because he helped work with the Sunfists to help bring the, the craft back up to uh, uh, interest of everybody. Yeah, yeah. That's cool. That's cool. The, the guy that started uh, the school I went to, he's lesser known, but he is a big part in the uh, this revival as well. Um, uh, his his name is Yaran. The technique of making these baskets was entirely forgotten. Uh, so this is all these are it's four pieces of wood that is bent in a certain way to make this whole together. Um, and he, he he figured out how to to make them again uh, and spent a lot of time in that. Uh, so he, he also did a big thing for for Slade. Uh, yeah. We need a lot of people like that. Even more. Hey, Klaus, can you tell us uh, what website they can find you at and about your social media uh, information? Yeah. yeah, so I'm at everywhere, sort of, uh, at Klaus Creations. Um, I have my website is klauscreations.com. I'm on Instagram and Facebook and YouTube. Uh, I'm, I make some videos of some projects. Um, but it's not a focus uh, but i'm very active on instagram uh, you can get a hold of me through my website or through instagram or facebook that's the easiest ways yeah and then you also have t-shirts and things available on your website with your logo on it yes i have some t-shirts there if you want to buy bowls or or objects i make uh, it's easiest to contact me uh, direct, directly and i usually make things uh, custom so people order what they want and i make them a bowl or whatever do, they want. do you make your knives for sale no i don't <laughs> I don't have the patience for for blacksmithing anymore, um, and I, I I'm not good enough at it that I would sell them uh, with a good conscience. Uh, they're good enough for me, but I wouldn't sell them. But if you check out for Forty Axis, my buddy Nick uh, on Instagram, he's a wonderful blacksmith and a really good dude. He's from Canada. Uh, but he lives in Sweden to learn about Swedish traditional blacksmithing. Um, so check him out and get some access and stuff from him. Yeah. Uh, the, the spoon that you showed us had a very dark yes. bowl compared to the handle. How did you achieve that? Uh, by you. <laughs> so it's, it's just, it all was this color from the beginning but this has been used daily for four years and that's how it looks after that so that's Is it finished, all. finished with linseed oil yeah yes regular uh, raw linseed oil raw linseed oil yeah yeah, yeah. i try to the, there's a few swedish companies that make uh, linseed oil in a traditional way with no extra stuff in it. Uh, so I buy it from them. Uh, so it's the same stuff you would buy at a grocery store, more or less. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. And do you, uh, do you just wash that as normal? Just wash it in the sink or do you not yeah. wash it, turns it off or? Yeah, yes, in the sink, 
regular as everything else um, and it it will hold up and if it doesn't you carve another one uh, that's my way of looking at it um, so yeah yeah but I, I I don't keep many of my things. I just uh, give them away where I so I don't really know the the lifespan of my spoons or my cutting boards or whatever it is. Mm. But they, it's like, yeah, like the spoon it has been used every day for four years and it has darkened a bit. That's the only thing that has changed. Mm. More Any other questions. questions from the group? Klaus, you mentioned during your presentation that your bowls were being photographed. Yes. What was that for? Oh, I, I don't know if I can tell you, <laughs> but it's uh, uh, there's a Swedish magazine that talks about crafts uh, and they uh, they have like this spread about upcoming uh, wood craftsmen and crafts people um, and i'm gonna be part of that and that's super big for me yeah congratulations thank you thank you hmm. so it will be another month until i get the magazine but i'm i'm just I'm so excited. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, Klaus. Kla Klaus. Hello. Yeah. This is uh, Russell Scott from Minnesota. I was wondering, uh, have you ever been in the, the the United States before? No, I haven't. If if you do, uh, come on over to uh, Minnesota and to Iowa, where we have a very strong, as we would call it, Scandinavian. Um, a community of the Swedes and Nords and Finns. Yeah. <clears throat> and as a matter of fact, in Minneapolis, we have the Swedish Institute. I don't know if you ever heard of that. No, I haven't. Uh, they would be, I, I'm sure if you contact them, they'd be pretty, pretty happy to, to display any of your, your artwork. Yeah, and that's then, awesome. And then we also have um, uh, Decora, Iowa, which just, uh, just in the northern part of Iowa. The uh, they have the Vesterheim there, which which also displays a lot of Scandi Scandinavian uh, artwork there. And uh, like I said, we got a very strong uh, Scandinavian heritage around here. So if yeah. you uh, ever have a chance to come to the United States, uh, come on over. Or unless if you come to usually when you leave your country to go to another country, you you want to you want to see different people. You know, you go to New York or. <laughs> or Los, Los Angeles, unless you don't want to come to see some more Swedes and Norts and, and Finns. Yeah, I, I just want to see crafts. That's my crafts and crafts people. That's my yeah. big interest. Yeah, well, there's a lot there, here. He references that museum in northeastern Iowa. That's in the area where Harley lives. Yeah. And he used to be a professor at the local college on uh, Scandinavian uh, history, art, and uh, teaches classes in that area. Um, cool. he, he's a remarkable individual. He's he's linked in with many of the people on this Zoom session here yeah. in the U.S. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah, and if you have the opportunity to come over when you have some kind of a event going on, usually he displays uh, and he uh, demonstrates, and it's it's really it's really interesting. Yeah, you would enjoy him. He's a wonderful individual. Yeah. That sounds really amazing. I would really enjoy this. I ah oh, got them um, <laughs> COVID. Yeah. As soon as it's over, I would love to, to travel. I would love to see some American redwood trees and I would love to go to Japan and see some joinery and there's so much beautiful stuff out there. Mm. Uh, so there's a question in the chat about what wood you would recommend for shrink pots for someone do, uh, doing their first shrink pot. Birch. Birch. It's, yeah, birch for everything. Does it, does it dry the easiest and doesn't crack or is it just easier to work with? Both. 
it's good in both ways. I've done some like crazy elm stuff and like it's horrible to work with. Um, it holds up, uh, but it, it's horrible to work with. Um, so birch is like when you talk about Swedish uh, traditional stuff like this, it's usually if you don't know what species to use, use birch uh, because that's what has been used here uh, most likely. Yeah. And yeah, I think I think we only did in did those ones in Birch when I was at school as well. But this this is actually elm. It doesn't look like it because it's only the outer wood that is light, lighter. Uh, but this one is Birch and this one as well. And the black one I had somewhere is also birch. This one is also birch. Yes, this is painted with a mix of um, linseed oil, some black pigment and some chalk to make it uh, more matte in the finish. Like that. <clears throat> Yep. <laughs> Any more questions? Yeah, one more. Um, have you ever dealt with or played with or carved with uh, Dala horses or anything like that? No, I have not made any Dala horses. And uh, they are made maybe a two hour car ride from where I live. And so I've been to the factory and seen how they make them and such. Um, but I have not made them. My mm -hmm. wife, who also do does a lot of woodworking and crafts, uh, she has some similar horses, um, but it's, uh, that has a little bit of a different story to them. Yeah. But the the dollar horses is it's a very local tradition. Uh, to move and there's a lot of people who do a lot of dollar horses in that area. Yeah. So it's so like a dime a dozen, as we would say here. Yeah, yeah. Everybody does it. Yeah. It's the same here in, in Minnesota. We carve out dollar. Well, we dollar everything, make a little animal, put the dollar paint on it. People love it here. Yeah. yeah. Horses, everything, uh, everything. Mm. It's, it's very interesting to hear that there's so much like interest in Scandinavian woodcrafts in other places. Uh, we're used to in Sweden to to talk about it amongst ourselves, but and we always talk about American culture or British culture or whatever. But we rarely hear people having an interest in Swedish culture, maybe about music because we're good at that. Um, but it's really nice to hear that you know so much and you have an interest in it. That's super cool. It's very encouraging. Yes, yeah, Swedish steel is actually quite good. Yes. So the tools made there are extremely good. Yes. I am born in Sandviken, where Sandvik, the company, uh, the steel company, uh, was started. Uh, so I'm like born in the in the shadow of that big factory. Um, and so we have a big pride in our steel, uh, especially here locally. I live a 10 minute ride from the factory. Uh, I have the Vetterlings X factory three minutes away with my car and some really good blacksmiths my father-in-law is a super talented traditional blacksmith. Um, makes a lot of like church or ornamentations and things like that. So we're good with the steel, and I'm happy about that. Yeah. 
Well, we're sure. on. Uh, we're we're about fifteen after the hour, so I'm going to yep. go ahead and stop you at this point. Um, wanted to take time out and thank you for coming on and sharing with us. Uh, yeah. Thanks for all. That thank you, you so do. much. This is excellent. Yeah, it's very unique stuff. Very nice. So we appreciate you taking time out and sharing with us today. Um, and and we know it's late there, so we appreciate you <laughs> taking time out from your family to come and join us. I uh, want to remind everyone that um, we'll be having upcoming meetings next week. We'll have Brian Milton coming on of Rough Cut Craft. You can find him on Instagram. Uh, he'll be talking about life-size carvings. Um, several people coming up uh, for February, March, and April, so make sure you join us. Uh, wanted to thank uh, Chip Chats again for sponsoring us and helping us out as far as giveaways and things like that. And you'll notice Tom and I both have uh, advertising posters from them. Uh, make sure you go out and shop with them if you get a chance. Um, and I also wanted to thank everybody for the donations in the Buy Me a Coffee fundraiser. Uh, I've posted the link over in the chat if anybody wants to click on that and uh, donate. Again, that goes towards having these meetings each week and making sure that we can cover the, uh, the fee that it costs for us to have the meeting. So thank you all for participating in that. Uh, all of these videos go out on um, um, on YouTube, so make sure you go out and subscribe and join there. Uh, check out the videos, make comments, and I think I said uh, chip chaps, but I meant chipping away. Uh, make sure you uh, go out and see chipping away. So um, thank you all for joining us today. Again, this is the International Association of Woodcarvers, where we meet every week at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, we'll see you all next week at three o'clock with Brian Melton. So we'll uh, tune in then. Thank you all for joining us today. Thanks, Thanks Scott.